Greetings, Factorians. It's your boy, Griswold. And today we're taking a tour of my recently completed, compact, grid-based, one rocket per minute, bot-free train factory that I am affectionately calling the Ant Farm. Now I named it that because it's based on short trains with a maximum of two cargo wagons, darting around this very odd looking yet highly effective grid-based rail pattern. Using a grid ensures that there's a path between every station and allows us to work entirely without logistics robots. Each of these production cells is surrounded by our standard two-lane highway, but they also have a dedicated lane for drop-offs on the top left and pickups on the bottom right. With this layout, we're able to stack up to three trains in a waiting area without blocking the main roads. There's a four-lane to two-lane T-junction in between each production cell, and since we don't have quite enough room to fit a full four-way junction, each column has a roundabout that lets trains move from one row up or down to the next. This rail system makes for some strange, yet interesting pathfinding behaviors. You might find trains performing seemingly pointless loop-de-loops, and because the pickups and drop-offs move in this clockwise direction, sometimes trains have to make three rights instead of a left, or vice versa. Our T-junction doesn't leave quite enough room for optimal signaling, so trains may have to wait for an intersection to clear when it's not absolutely necessary. So the system is not without its drawbacks, but all the same, this 5x4 grid is currently supporting 60 trains and consistently launches one rocket per minute within a 2% margin of error, free of deadlocks or manual intervention. The factory is compact enough such that every cell can fit within the minimap, and each cell is viewable in its entirety from the maximum zoom level. The size of these cells is based on a full six blue belts worth of throughput. If a production facility takes more than six belts worth of input, or puts out more than six belts worth of output, then it gets its own cell. For example, iron plate smelting happens in three cells, because we need 18 full belts worth of iron. This helps with congestion, and for a resource that's particularly popular, like green chips, we'll split it amongst two cells just to reduce wait time for trains. At drop-off stations, each cargo wagon is unloaded by 12 stack inserters, buffered into chests, and then unloaded onto belts by stack inserters, which are rigged to a circuit network that ensures the belts are fully saturated and without gaps. Shout out to Dyson27 for the original unloader design, I made some slight improvements, and I also made them animate in this wavy fashion, so if you're looking for the blueprint, that's in the description. Now you'll basically find a mirror image of this blueprint at the pickup stations. We need a little more than three stack inserters to clean up a fully compressed blue belt, so we round up to four. None of this would be possible without the longer underground belt length introduced in the .15 update. This allows us to clean a full belt worth of input by splitting the belt, feeding that to two stack inserters, then sending the belts under the train back up to two more stack inserters. This pattern is nice and compact and lets us load three full belts into a cargo wagon. So with our two cargo wagon trains, we can load and unload six full belts worth of resources. Now for a closer look at the production cells. When it comes to smelting, we'll largely see the same pattern repeated over and over. Three cells are dedicated to iron plate, Two cells are dedicated to steel, as they each require six belts worth of iron plate as input. We have a little less than two cells dedicated to copper plate, as we only need about 10 belts worth of output. As the most popular shared resource, green chips get two cells. For drop-offs that require multiple resources, you'll also notice that the stack inserters from our train unloader array have been replaced with filter stack inserters. This allows us to extract an approximately correct ratio of resources from our cargo wagons. Since we're working with multiples of three belts, belt balancers are used in most cells to divide the input lines evenly to the correct number of subfactories. Red chips actually break the six belts worth of input rule by having two drop-offs, but there are always exceptions in life. There are four subfactories in the red chip cell. Four doesn't go into six, but four goes into 12. So if I have two drop-offs, then I can unload 12 belts and serve four subfactories. By the time we've made it to the third row of the grid, the output belts are looking much less saturated as the resources down here, like blue chips and speed modules, all take a lot of time and resources to complete. In these cases, we don't need the full array of stack inserters to clean up the belts, and we'll actually only need one cargo wagon behind our locomotives. In that, the third row is largely unremarkable. That is except for the train yard. In order to maintain throughput when using trains, we need to minimize downtime in between loading and unloading. 
This means having multiple trains with the same schedule servicing the same stations. Depending on the throughput requirements of any given station, a schedule can be duplicated and shared by up to as many as six trains. The train yard houses master copies of every schedule in the factory, 18 in total. Trains are color-coded so that they are easily identifiable, and their cargo wagons have been set up with slot filters to ensure that they're filled up with the correct ratio of resources for mixed pickups. The train yard was used to adjust the number of train copies during development of the factory. The number of trains has been precisely configured so as to maintain a healthy balance between throughput and rail congestion. The fourth and final row houses the really freaky production cells. We're talking low density structure, satellite production, oil refineries, silos, and rocket fuel. And each one of these cells has its own little quirks. Low density structure has two drop offs with different types of resources, one for copper and plastic and another for steel. Silos are fairly straightforward as we're just dropping off three resources. However, we do need two silos to launch one rocket per minute because the rocket launch animation takes a pretty long time. I don't even really want to talk about the satellite. That just takes a whole hodgepodge of stuff. But I do want to talk about the oil refinery. It uses six of these mirrored sub refineries that share a pipe for heavy oil, but dedicate a pipe to both light oil and petroleum as we need two pipes to meet the throughput demands for these fluids. After cracking all heavy oil, we store both petroleum gas and light oil above the refineries in fluid storage tanks. A circuit network monitors the relative level of petroleum gas to light oil. This circuit maintains a 21 to 34 ratio of light oil to petroleum as we're only using light oil for rocket fuel. When the level of light oil exceeds that of petroleum as defined by this ratio, a pump turns on and passes light oil to these cracking plants, thereby converting just enough light oil to petroleum in order to maintain the ratio that we're looking for. This ensures that the pipes in our oil refinery will never be clogged up with byproducts. The oil refinery is strategically located so as to keep all of the cells which require fluid products within a reasonable pipe's distance. This way we don't need extra trains towing around fluid wagons causing further congestion. Two pipes of oil are passed to rocket fuel on the right, and petroleum is passed in two pipes to the plastic cell above. Another petroleum line goes to sulfuric acid at the satellite production facility, which is largely used for batteries, but the rest of it is passed upstairs to blue chips. The final cell is rocket fuel. Rocket fuel has one ingredient, which is solid fuel, which has one ingredient, which is light oil, which is why the rocket fuel cell is right next door to the oil refinery. You'll notice the pickup station for rocket fuel has an extra belt split off. And what it's doing is feeding rocket fuel into our locomotives. Now it might seem a little excessive to use rocket fuel to power our trains, but given all the starting and stopping that happens at the junctions in this factory, we can't discount the significance of having a 180% boost to vehicle acceleration. So for the most part, rocket fuel is consumed by rockets and satellites, but the rest of it is ferried around the factory dropped off at strategic locations unique to each one of the train schedules and passed into the locomotives as they stop at the adjacent stations. This makes the refuel car a real joy to ride as it traverses the entire factory grid. Now, before you get too impressed, I did use the creative mode mod to build this factory, but it was designed such that everything here would be possible in vanilla. The creative mode mod allows me to use this as a stand-in for a power plant and ore comes from these duplicating provider chests. Fluid comes from infinite fluid sources, and each of these raw resources are placed outside the main factory to simulate a trip into the wilderness. It would probably take thousands of hours to construct this all in vanilla, let alone design it. And I've already spent a lot of time on this factory. So with that, I'll leave you with a time lapse of one of my favorite intersections and bid you adieu. Thanks for watching and keep on automating.